Welcome to Ozcast, the platform where we take a deep dive into the science and research behind the issues impacting Australian waterways. Each week, we team up with experts in their field to take a look below the surface. Well, Matt, welcome to Ozcast. This is the first or the premiere episode, I think you will. I'm super excited. Um, so thanks for everyone for tuning in so far. But to have you on as the first guest, I'm pretty excited. I have a feeling our conversation today might not be full of excitement because it can be considered a bit of a depressing topic for some. Um, you did give me some reading to do, which yeah, it wasn't pleasant reading, I, I might add. But um, I'm pumped to get into what is a really interesting but also important topic. I, I know some scholars and literature has labeled it as the biggest environmental crisis we're currently facing but maybe one that not everyone knows about so mm -hmm. i'm keen to to dive in but firstly thanks for jumping on yeah look thanks for the opportunity i'm i'm honored to be part of the first yeah the uh, first the podcast. very first one yeah. so we're up here on the north coast um we made the drive up from newcastle today which is exciting but we're sitting here on a a nice little beach town so i think it's fitting we're going to get stuck into all things both freshwater and saltwater uh, but mate, before we get into it, a, a little bit about how you got here and kind of why a lot of your colleagues and a lot of your friends did throw you under the bus to be to be in episode number one and you don't get here, you know, overnight. So I, I, I did see that your career started in 95 or around then. So just give us a couple minutes on, on how you're sitting here today and kind of how it's all panned out. Sure. Well, I guess I'm a, I'm a veterinarian by training, so yep. university qualified veterinarian and veterinary degrees give you a very broad uh, teaching about animals right. everything is compared to the other one so you start with the dog and then a horse is a dog with one toe <laughs> and a cat's a dog that it goes, goes on and so it goes and a fish is a dog with scales but we didn't get taught too much in fish but I, I had an interest before going into the vet degree yeah. in fish and what and university was that that was through Sydney University Sydney. and uh, so we did five years down there and yep. then I got distracted mid-degree by the beauty of the eyelashes of dairy cows, which are quite fascinating and really loved dairy. And uh, so I got into being a dairy vet for about uh, five or six years. Right. I worked in the dairy industry in uh, the Manning Valley and then up on the north coast yeah. with Norco. And um, it, was a, it was a great period of time through some difficulties in the industry, but it also threw its difficulties at me in picking up heavy cows. I got a bit good at right. fixing their feet and injured my back and my physio said you need to find some smaller animals to play with yeah. <laughs> because you can't keep on with what you're doing. Cows are too big. They're too big. And uh, so I went, oh, maybe it's time to go back to, to fish. Mm -hmm. So I retraced my steps a little bit and asked around about trying to make the career jump out of cats, dogs, cows, birds and into fish. And yep. there wasn't really a pathway there. But I did meet a, a chap called Richard Callanan who was New South Wales only fish vet in the government ranks at right. the time and he happened to be based at the vet lab in Wollombar up in uh, uh, between Lismore and, and Ballina and he said look we might have a job coming up you should apply for it so I gave it a dash and somehow landed it through telling some good enough stories and dick being <laughs> generous of heart and uh, and so it was I was I found myself in a fisheries position right where I was in part involved in investigating fish kills so at the time we had some very big ones then, that was around 2000, I started in 2000 with the state government right. and we had a big kill in the Richmond in 2001 related to flooding. Yep. Uh, so I got quite involved in some major fish kills around the state investigating why were they dying yep. and trying to understand could we prevent them and particularly around the idea were there disease agents, so nasty bacteria or viruses that were causing these problems that we got particularly concerned about. So was that fish kill in the Richmond? I've actually never heard of that one. So, you know, did you did you get to the bottom of it? Yeah, so we learnt a lot uh, out of our initial investigation. So the fish primarily died of a lack of oxygen in the water. Um, but how the water came to have no oxygen was right. was uh, where the was the beginning of the journey yeah. as, to, as to how did the water come to have no oxygen in yeah. it in 35 kilometres of river. Um, and that was a much longer story to do with uh, how we've modified the landscape on that particular catchment by uh, changing wetlands in particular, right. which we have these soil types along the east coast of Australia called uh, acid sulphate soils. It's the very ancient soils, and because years ago the sea level was higher and the, the, the marine environment contains lots of sulphur, yeah. that was deposited in the sediments. And then when the sea level went down, the sulphur stayed in those sediments in wetlands and fortunately, in normal wetlands, it stayed wet 
Um, so the key is wet. Mm-hmm. Um, in wetland, they're meant to be wet. It's weird. Uh, it's a the funky <laughs> Funny name. concept. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. But it works. Um, and it works because water actually doesn't have much oxygen in it. So normal water, uh, so sort of in a, in a river or even in the sea, we're talking about only eight or maybe 10 parts per million of oxygen in the water. Now that's compared to air, which has mm. 21,000 parts per million. Right. So fish are already immediately vastly more awesome than we are yeah. in dealing with incredibly low oxygen. Levels, yeah. If you put us into eight parts per million. No good. It's a uh, game over human. Right. So they have these superior skills to extract this tiny amount of oxygen. But that tiny amount of oxygen, when you put it in soil, means the soil doesn't have much oxygen to oxidize things. Right. So oxygen is a fuel. And that fuel in soil, if there's not much of it, means those soils are quite stable. Right. If you drain them, you get air going into the soil. The wet goes down mm-hmm. as the water table drops with drainage. Now you've got 21,000 parts of oxygen around your soil, and now you've got a lot of fuel. And unfortunately, the fuel in the soil makes acid in that particular type of soil. It makes sulfuric acid, and it causes lots of other bad reactions in the drain, and and that contributes to a a chemical called MBO, Mm. which sounded really technical when I read the first word. It says monosulfitic black ooze. So the O's for ooze. Right. So it's black gunk that sits in the bottom of a drain. Okay. And it's tremendously oxygen uh, demanding. And when flood water pushes that out into a river, it sucks the oxygen down out of the water in the river. So it's not that that's not the same as like a black water event that we saw in the Murray Darling Basin recently, so where the organic matter build up. Is, is is it a similar there's, concept? There's two drivers. So that's one is that, and some of that was in the Murray Darling because we've done the same to some wetlands there, and we do have some acid sulfate soils even in the Murray Darling. Yeah. So the inland sea in Australia was marine uh, when sea level was much higher. So we have these sediments in a range of places across our continent. But the other big driver is the one you, you mm. mentioned there is vegetation, and particularly vegetation change. So again, a wetland designed to be wet, the plants that live there like being wet. So in wetlands, we have all types of vegetation that's very happy being inundated. Yep. It doesn't die. In fact, it dies if it's not inundated. So the process of drainage means your wetland and wet tolerant plants die. And then other plants, grow and particularly if we want to use that area for farming or grazing we might Mm. plant paspalum or kaikuyu or some other non-native grass Mm. which is in fact very flood intolerant now when we get a flood a wetland does what a wetland does which is it fills up with water whether we want it to or not yep when that grass sits in that water it dies and when it rots the process of decomposition chews oxygen The fuel that drives decomposition is oxygen and there's only a little bit in the water and when you're out, you're out. So when that water then drains off out the drain because we now, instead of leaving the water in the wetland Mm -hmm. to process out, we drain the country. So we actually hasten the speed that that water hits the river and as it charges into the river at different points of the river from the drains, you get a jet of no oxygen water and another jet here and they literally close in on the fish and we get pockets of fish that can't escape out of the river to avoid deoxygenated water. So when we hear a, a black water event, which we have a lot since I think it was about uh, late October, November, that's that's the process that we've that's, seen. That's the process and it happens the same in the western drainage as it does here on the on the eastern drainage. Yep. And it's very much to do with changes in vegetation type mm. as we've changed the way that water sits on the landscape right um due to concerns about drainage so you were kind of thrown in the deep end at the richmond well i guess you could say that started with fish kills and then i think what we're going to get to today is talking about microplastics and and nanoplastics i think they're the same we'll soon find out um how did you transition into that so what's uh so during the course of the five years i spent with dpi did a lot of disease investigation and and began to understand that there were two types of things that cause disease in animals which we broadly kind of my brain works like an old windows operating system basically so slow slow (laughs) and and (laughs) methodical so we have a drop down menu at the top as we start the drop down menu says over here it's an infectious disease over here it's a non-infectious disease right 
If it's infectious, it could be a virus, could be a parasite, could be a bacteria, could be a fungus, and it drops down to different types of viruses. Over on this side, non-infectious things, initially I didn't really have a lot of a grasp about what was in that bucket of drivers of disease, mm-hmm. but it, it's become increasingly a source of both fascination and interest for me, but increasingly important to understand the health of animals being driven by non-infectious disease agents. And they can be things such as plastic or the chemicals that are within plastics. They can be pesticides. They can be personal care products coming out of wastewater or out of septic tank drainage. They can be uh, even just changes in the natural dynamics. So temperature uh, is a non-infectious cause of, of problems. If it's too hot, the fish will stress. Right. More stress means they might get sick or they might die and, and they might not reproduce. So... What I became very involved in was in fish farming, so in aquaculture. So I I had to acquire a lot of knowledge about how do I get the most fish to survive because this was now a profit motive in fish farming. So my aim now is forget about the landscape, just in a little confines of a tank or a pond, how do I get the maximum number of fish out? And I was working with native fish from the beginning. So we'd take a silver perch, we'd get one pair of them, and yeah, you can't be anything but impressed about the reproductive potential of fish. Mm-hmm. As humans, you know, I think we, we sometimes feel, well, we, we get amazed at the ability of some mothers to have twins or triplets, which sounds, you know, wow, that's amazing. You had triplets. That's incredible. Um, but fish, well, silver perch, you know, they have 400,000, 500,000 progeny from a pair of fish. <laughs> which is kind of a mind-blowing amount of kids if, uh, if, we, if we transferred it across a bit, awfully big house and family. But that's how the fish, many of our fish species work, is very big uh, uh, reproductive efforts. And so we then had to understand how do you make those fish? And we found that if you had a dry pond and you put water in it, within the first week, life would begin in the pond out of nowhere. You didn't put any life to it to start with? You didn't have to add life. There was life in the soil. Right. And then suddenly the primary productivity, we call it, of an aquatic system would start, driven by a little bit of nutrient in the soil, a little bit of grass and carbon, a little bit of phosphorus there, and that was enough to bloom algae. And then there were cysts in the soil Mm -hmm. from the old zooplankton, so the next kind of little level up in the food where we start with the microalgae and then the zooplankton eat the microalgae and then our fish larvae, they love just the right size, little swimming zooplankton Mm. like a Daphnia, yum. The big eyes and they just mow it down. And so if we could maximize the amount of food in that pond, more food meant more meals, more meals meant more little mouths would get fed and the higher our survival of fish became Mm. in the pond. So I was learning how to fine-tune reproduction in a very controlled setting. But also then it became apparent to me, well, if they're doing it like this in my pond, that must be how they do it in the river. Yeah. And so are the conditions in the river then suitable? Are we maximising recruitment in our fisheries or have we done things that mean it doesn't work that well? Would that make sense? And so during all this time, there's lots of kind of public stories going about you know, fisheries in decline, fishermen catching too many fish, overfishing, overfishing, just endlessly kind of pounding into your eardrums. I'm like, oh, yeah, but we've got regulation. We've got hmm. size limits, catch limits. We've got tightly regulated commercial fishery. We actually don't have a very big commercial fishery. Could they catch them all? It just didn't seem to stack up. What, and to say that commercial fishers could... Could, fish, could mathematically fish out fish down everything. what we've got yeah. in Australia. And you went, nah. It just didn't stack. Yeah. And it's like, no, nah, there's other pieces to this puzzle that we're not really recognising. And those pieces came back to the success of breeding and that early bottom end of the food web that's essential for fish to breed. So we knew back in our silver perch pond, for example, if, if we couldn't get the algae bloom started mm. and we stocked the larvae, and there was no tucker, well, there'd be very few fingerlings come out of that pond. It would be a disaster. We knew if we over-fertilised that pond and we grew blue-green algae, we'd get a terrible return 
mm. out of the pond. So we hear about our rivers getting blue-green algae blooms now from excessive nutrient. And we're like, hmm, well, it definitely won't help get more fish in that river. If we, uh, at the time the fish are trying to breed, they're trying to breed amongst a blue-green algae bloom. That is not fine dining for yep, fish. Right. So it's not going to create the sustenance to get the big populations through. So I started thinking, well, there's, there's other pieces here. And, and, and that's why I started exploring this big non-infectious box. So when you say non-infectious, what's, what's an example of an infectious? So infectious diseases. So we've had some clangers in Australia. We had... Things like the uh, pilchard herpes virus. Right. So back in '95, yep. that uh, came into Australia. It was probably exotic to Australia. We're not exactly certain how it got here, but probably through some sort of an import channel. And uh, it it uh, established in southern Australia. It turned left and right, and it, it and it as a as a propagating epidemic. It it burned around the sardine stocks, the pilchard stocks all the way up to uh, Iluka on the north coast of New South Wales and all the way up to around Geraldton, a little bit further on the west coast of WA. It hopped across the ditch and went to New Zealand and it knocked around their sardine stock as well. But what so, did it actually... So in that case, the virus was propagating in the gills of the fish and it was damaging their ability to breed and it caused them to die. They suffocated because their gills were wrecked. So it was kind of like an ultra-severe COVID for fish mm destroying the lungs of the fish, which we call gills, and, uh, and the fish then died en masse. And we lost about 70% of our sardine stock died in 1995. So that was an infectious disease. It spread fish to fish to fish. Yep. And we know that birds were catching sick fish and then dropping, dropping them. It. And then that was propagating it. And the currents were washing water full yeah. of virus. The stocks were intermingling with each other. And so we had this huge epidemic. Does... Does a predatory fish have the ability to catch that by eating one of them? Fortunately for that particular virus, it had a, a very tight, uh, what we call species, tropism. It only liked the one species. So it was only right. that, that sardine that was susceptible to that virus. And then prawns went through something similar, didn't they? Yeah, that's another good example is, is the white spot virus that affected prawns. Although I think it's a, there's a little bits of the story there that's still yet to be fully... Mm. told with the prawn virus um, about why it happened, where it happened. So what, what uh, we talk about as a veterinarian is we use this word epidemiology, which probably was never really a common word until COVID, I think, and mm. then suddenly there's all these epidemiologists on the news and everywhere else. So epidemiology is the science of disease spread. So whereabouts, uh, when, where, and why diseases are transmitting or moving. And how? And how? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's all these pieces. And and so with uh, White Spot, it uh, was something that I'd, I'd actually written the formative paper with my former boss, Richard Callan, about how is Australia going to get White Spot virus, which currently, which, which at the time was only really in Southeast Asia. And I said, if we get it, our prawn farms are going to be in a lot of trouble, mm. um, like the Southeastern Asian uh prawn farms who got decimated and there's billions of dollars of loss to that particular disease in prawn farms. And it happened, didn't it? And it happened. So it was a little bit of a Nostradamus moment because we, we submitted that back into a process back in about 2007. Um, so it was a long time ago. Mm. And we said it will come in via imported prawns. And it did. And it very likely did. Mm. And they'll get used by recreational anglers. And it did. And it did because... You know, we're Aussies and probably to some extent we're just a bit, we're a bit tight asses. That's kind mm. of what Aussies are. Probably a lack of education yeah. there too, to be honest. Well, the, we, we tried in the smallest form to educate with the, with the packs. Yeah. So on the back of the pack we have in the very fine font, do not use as bait, mm. only, only cook, but we're not always... We should make it smaller font to see if we can see it better. Because <laughs> you can't, it's not very, it's, it's not very prominent on the pack. It's pretty tricky and, and it's certainly, you know... The public, the general public, were probably very unaware both of the, even the existence yeah. of prawn farms and the risks to prawn yeah. farms from the virus, and so it it came in in late 2016, but very interestingly was where it came in. So the farm that got it first is immediately opposite a wastewater outfall. That's interesting. There's things that come out of wastewater mm. outfalls that aren't necessarily terrific for the health of prawns or fish. Some of those things are plastics. So we see coming out of uh, clothing um, 
So the fibres in a polyester shirt, for example, so polyester is, is a plastic fibre. And um, many textiles now and things that contain stretch and uh, shininess are often uh, plastic-derived uh, textiles. When we wash them, you find over time they get thinner. Mm. And the thinner bit is the bit you lost. It's gone down the pipe to the wastewater treatment plant. A lot of it gets caught up in the sl- what they call the sludge pond, right. but some of it will get discharged uh, into the waterway. And so we have this continuous flow of microplastics, which is a, a word we use for quite small, under five millimetre plastics, and nanoplastics, which are extremely small. The nano's meant to denote a, uh, a size of around 10 to the minus nine. So very, very small sized plastic, uh, which is actually then able to not only get into a body by being ingested, but it can actually get into a cell mm. of your body. So much, much smaller. Well, this leads me probably to you know, an interesting part of one of the papers you actually sent me through. I did, like I said, I did some reading before this. The idea that a, a microplastic, which is, and, and we'll get to exactly how that process occurs shortly, but has the ability to absorb and carry chemicals mm. due to its, I guess, surface area, which to us is tiny, but to the other sediments, and, you know, you'll correct me here, is actually quite large because, you know, we're comparing you know, micro microscopic things here. So is that a great example of a, a plastics carrying a disease through? Well, so they're, they're not so much carrying the disease agents, they're not causing the infection. But what can happen with the, the chemicals that they carry is they can affect the immune system right. of the animal. So their immunity to things may go lower and they're not able to fight off things that they normally would or could. And it can have other undesirable effects, particularly around reproduction. So um, they can make their sperm less motile. So the swimmers simply aren't as good at swimming. Yep. And if they're not good at swimming, they don't find the egg. And mm. if they don't find the egg, it doesn't happen. Right. So, uh, but is that because of the, the plastics or is that because of the chemicals? Or is it a, is it a okay. mix of both? Yeah, so the plastic, we probably need to go back into what is even a plastic. Yeah. So plastics in their, in their source origin come from... Uh, a, their backbone is is gas, so is is fossil gas. So they're really the origin of plastics and the creation of plastics is a petrochemical um, that's come out of the petrochemical industry, which is probably not front of mind for people when we we talk about you know, climate change and mm. fossil fuels. We don't necessarily think oh plastic, fossil fuel, but in fact it's entirely the origins of what we're talking about are the source is a fossil fuel derived source. So the boom in plastics very much came on the back of the boom in gas in the US when they discovered uh, used new technology to extract gas out but using fracking. And they had this huge volume of gas suddenly that was available and they went, markets, we need to find markets to put this into and plastics were one of the things that they went, these, these could be useful, we, we find them useful, we can put them in bags, we can put them, we can cover your vegetables in them, we can wrap your bait in them, we can... Make fishing lures. We can do yeah. all kinds of things with this stuff. It has you know, incredible utility. But as a backbone of a plastic, it's actually not that useful. It's quite brittle, and so it doesn't have much strength. It's not flexible, and, and so they... They then have to add in what we call plasticizers or chemical additives to the plastic to give it properties that we like, that it's flexible, that we can have a squeezy bag, that we can have strength, that it doesn't break, uh, we, can, we can make it slippery, we can make it colourful. Mm. Um, so these are all additives into this plastics polymer, we call it, a big long chain of, of carbon atoms. and we add other things in there to get it to do what we find useful. Now, that that, um, uh, group of chemicals that are added, turns out many of those have undesirable side effects on on life. Uh, So whether you're an algae, or you're a zooplankton, or you're a fish, or you're a human, in fact, right through there appear to be undesirable effects from these additives um, and the issue seems to be that we're getting a cumulative exposure issue. So the amount is going up, 
each year there's more. Each year we're making more. Mm. We're not capturing it. So we don't stop it getting to the wastewater treatment plant. We don't uh, stop it getting out of the wastewater treatment plant. We don't trap the sludge and keep it somewhere. Mm -hmm. We trap it for a little while, but then we have to empty the pond. And then we take the sludge and we put it typically back into agriculture. So in my home catchment at the Richmond on Ballina, our sludge goes back out onto a tea tree plantation uh, out near Woodburn. Right. Which was recently about two metres underwater. That's all now back in the, the system. So the circularity mm. of water, our water cycle, brings this stuff back around to us. So it's not so much that a microplastic is the carrier of chemicals. It's that, by definition, a microplastic is made up of other chemicals because we're continually changing the, the construction of that, and those chemicals are the ones that are having adverse effect on our, on our fish. Well, so it's the two, actually. So Both of them, right. So they actually do both. Double so, whammy. Yeah. Perfect. So So we get... <laughs> The plastic, uh, when you talk about virgin plastic, so when it's just made for its purpose, it will have those different chemicals in it, like your, you would have seen on a plastic bottle, something like a BPA-free. Mm. So the BPA part is a chemical called a bisphenol, and, and it's been shown to be one of these chemicals that does interfere with hormones in the body. And, and hormone systems very much control how we behave. Uh, so... If a person has very high testosterone as a man, they'll be very aggressive. If they have very low testosterone, they'll be very hug. Mm. These hormones influence our behavior quite dramatically, and they do so in fish as well. So we know that when fish get exposed to some of these uh, chemicals, so in some of the plastics we add an antibacterial agent in there, so a compound called triclosan. And some of our little uh, nesting fish that lay a little... Uh, the, the, the female lays her eggs and the male does the hard yards. He's guarding the nest. So he has to be there when uh, a predatory crayfish or another fish wants to come and eat those very nutritious looking eggs, he's got to fight them off to protect the clutch of eggs. If he's exposed to these chemicals out of plastic like triclosan, his behaviour, he loses his aggression. And he goes, you know what? I could defend the, I but, could defend the eggs, but you know yeah, what? I'm not, I'm not yeah, a fighter. Right. I'm not a fighter. It's funny how when you draw the link back, so it's, it makes so much sense that a fish that's lacking in testosterone or has their hormones changed is less likely to defend their nest, which means the the reproduction or or the the potential for those eggs that they're protecting to blossom into well, what could be more fish is just dramatically reduced. Wow. So suddenly we see very subtle effects. So the animal's still alive, mm. so it's not necessarily even visually sick. In fact, it will look quite normal. But behaviourally, even that level of change can seriously modify what happens to the output reproductively of the fish. So plastics contain these things. But the other thing that they do is when we call it an aged plastic. So a plastic that has been out in the environment now. So it's found its way into our waterways <clears throat> whether it's by wastewater, whether it's just simply a single-use plastic that's been dropped, blown mm -hmm. um, off a beach, out of a park, out of your backyard, mm -hmm. out of your car window, however it got there, a lot of it ends up there. And we think about 14 million tonnes a year is now ending up in waterways globally. Um, so a lot of material. The, uh, there are a range of other chemicals coming off our landscape. Um, and they're entering our waterways, and they, they concentrate particularly at the surface film. So right at the very, very top, like the top couple of millimetres of the sea, actually carries a lot of what we call hydrophobic uh, chemicals. So these are things like oils. So if you've ever put a drop of two-stroke oil comes out of your outboard and seen the oil yeah. go over the surface of the water. All those big oil slicks that you see out to sea when, say, a mine's burst or whatever it may be, the reason you see it is because it's floating, right? It's floating, yeah, yeah. yeah. So a lot of these things are quite buoyant. They don't want to mix with the water, and they're sitting right up in this surface layer. And some of that, you know, it's kind of like a little band of pollution. Now, the plastics, unfortunately, a lot of them are buoyant as well when they're small, and they're intermingling with this material and they get a chemical, like a positive negative connection, attraction to each other and the stuff adheres onto the plastic. 
so they can pick up what we call uh, hydrocarbons so other types of petroleum products can adhere to the surface of the plastic and then uh, some of the other pollutants in the surface of the water can get onto them as well. Now if that plastic then finds its way into being a food particle so the other things in the surface of water mm. is the best food for fish. So the very base of our kind of productivity so oceanic productivity we need the big burning thing in the sky give us all the energy we've got clear water that gets that energy into the water and algae with their little mini solar panels to turn it into protein turn it into something that is food that's all happening in that top the top meters of the water and then we've got this amazing movement of zooplankton out in the ocean every night where they're going up and down huge distances right to come and feed, come and rest, come and feed, come and rest, come and feed, come and rest, and this cycle's going on. Now, if you're coming up to the surface, and now some of the things that look like food, they're the same size as your food, mm -hmm. they don't move as fast because they don't, they're not alive. So easy prey. Easy prey. Easy pickings, yeah. And so there's mistakes being made by zooplankton thinking they're ingesting feed, but they're ingesting microplastic particles. So I was across in, in China just before COVID at, at uh, one of their universities there, uh, called Ocean University, and they were doing some experiments with, with algae and uh, microplastics and zooplankton. So they got healthy algae, they put them in the tank at the same density as microplastic particles. So let's just say there's 100 of each in the tank, and then we add some zooplankton in there. Now what they did was they put a dye on the plastic particles that was fluorescent so if the zooplankton ate a plastic particle it glowed in the dark you could put the party lights on it and the ones who ate the plastic had fluorescence in their bellies and so you could see what happened and then you were able to count how many particles had been eaten relative to each other and what they found was they ate more plastic than algae wow because that and they think likely because the algae have the ability to escape. So algae actually almost doesn't look like they're an animal. They're their own little animal and they have evasion mechanisms to not get eaten. Uh, so they have little tails and some of them can jet away when they're about to get ingested by a zooplankton and evade them. But plastic don't evade anything. Yeah, wow. And the, the, the downside to the story was then, well, what happens to the zooplankton? If they eat it, does it matter? Well... They did In that particular study, they were looking at growth of the zooplankton. So they usually grow, get bigger, and they reproduce and make more. And so you get a bigger density of zooplankton, which then becomes, again, more fish food or yep. prawn food or oyster food or abalone food, what, whatever. Everything eats zooplankton. Now, the, the growth slowed. You just didn't get as much zooplankton growth. So mm. the, what we call the biomass, like the total amount of there zooplankton as, yeah. was down. So clearly there was no nutritious value or very little nutrition in in the plastic cons consumed by these organisms. And that would carry on, wouldn't it? So for the for the predators that then eat, you know, all those microorganisms in the top few meters, they're then they're then consuming less, you know, nutrient rich food, if you would call it that. And correct. does the process not just keep so, going? Yes, yeah, so there's parts of this that we call bioaccumulation where they're accumulating up the chain and so this is some of the ways that we do get pollution to high pollutants in high levels in some of our top order yeah. predators so when we talk about big sharks very long lived they'll have quite high mercury levels from accumulations of mercury up that chain well that's what is that's the same as any of those bigger letter level pelagics where you're kind of you're directed not to eat them or consume them because of Correct. the mercury levels. Is that where that same principle? That's exactly what's happening. So right. your, your bigger fish are older yep. and they've simply consumed more uh, fish, bait fish in their life as a predator. And that bait fish has consumed algae. Mm -hmm. And then if that algal chain is contaminated, as it increasingly is globally, then our fish become contaminated. And we get to a point where the what was the most nutritious item on the planet so fish is the superfood of all superfoods forget your kale mm -hmm. forget your kale i do love kale kale it just you know doesn't compare it doesn't compare fish and seafood have the superior profile 
of essential fatty acids for human health and they're part of how we developed our brain into what it is, into being capable of the thought for good or for bad mm. that the human brain now participates in. So the one, the reason why we're directed at not eating certain fish, so as recreational anglers, we're, we're allowed, legally allowed to, but growing up, particularly if you're really into it, you'll, you'll be told, you know, kind of stay away from, you know, bigger mulloway, bigger Spanish mackerel, um, any of your kind of big marlin, for example. And the reason is because if you trace the food chain all the way back, there's potential that the original microorganisms that were originally consumed are contaminated. Correct. That's how it's wow. getting in there. So these are what we call food webs, yep. where the, the load of things can be moving through the, the whole population of the pyramid. Is it fair to say that that might not have been a problem a thousand years ago, for example, when when plastics weren't or, or you know, chemicals, plastics, everything wasn't produced and, and at, at such a mass scale and then end up in our waterways. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, look, things have changed dramatically with human population and with industrialization. Mm. So we see a tremendous takeoff point uh, around our modern industrial revolution of plastics was the 50s and 60s. So it coincided with both massive increases in population, increases in agriculture, increases in pesticides, so another petrochemical output of the petrol, petroleum industry mm -hmm. was the pesticide industry. And these things collectively radically started modifying water everywhere. So there are now no rivers in Australia that have agriculture on them that don't have agricultural chemicals in the river. They all have they them. They all have them. They're all running off some of them at higher levels, some of them at lower levels. But what that means is that the bottom of our food webs are being exposed and it's modifying how suitable they are for fish reproduction. So they evolved, these creatures evolved 450 million years ago. Our fish are ancient. So back in the Devonian period of history, uh, we had uh, the earliest uh, lasmobranchs, the earliest sharks and rays, and then we had the bony fish start to evolve after that. There were no pesticides in that era. Mm. There were some hydrocarbons that came around as a result of oil seeps and things like this, but they were relatively minor in the scale of what we're now involved in with 8 billion people on the mm. planet. Tremendous use of energy, tremendous extraction. Probably leads us to a good point about how these are, how these are getting into... Let's use Australia, for example, because... Um, myself and Zach today did make the comment, like we were driving into where we are today and, and noticed how underpopulated it was compared to other parts of the world, particularly other parts of Australia, someone like Sydney, you know, it's, I don't know what percentage of our population comes from Sydney, but there's a lot of it, right? So let's start, say, fresh water is, and I, I did know in the papers you sent that, that there was, was a distinction in how much study has been directed at salt and particularly things like turtles have consumed a lot of the the mainstream media when it comes to plastic because it's probably a, a more appealing and you know heartfelt topic but by the sounds of it it's 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 not the most you know it's not the most concerning topic whilst we love our turtles no one doesn't like a seabirds is the other one you sent me yeah they seem to be documented documented a lot but i, I hear nothing about our freshwater rivers i hear nothing about Murray Cod, for example, Australian bass, Macquarie perch, all those things. And I guess my question is around those towns and rivers aren't heavily populated as, as our Sydney ones are, right? Mm. So if you said, oh, Sydney's in a bad state, I'd go, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. It's Sydney. Six you know, people, it's six, yeah. There's that many people there that it, you, you kind of think, well, yeah, of course it is. But a little town out like near Moree, the Guada, the Murray, all, all those in, in the Murray-Darling Basin, are they in a bad state for microplastics? Well, it's, in, it's, it's I guess, a matter of grade. So from better mm. to worse, there's, there's virtually none that are uh, pristine. So very, very pristine water is very hard to find. So, you would ha so you're confident to say that there's no waterway of, or a very small number of waterways in Australia today that are not free of microplastics. Yeah. So they're so pervasive. So we've got them moving in ways that you wouldn't expect. So we've talked about the out the car mm. window or f out the back of the boat. How else do they get there? Well, they can come through the air. So we have atmospheric movement 
of plastic particles now. So they're literally raining out of the air. So we have so much plastic, and when it's small enough, it's very, very light. And so it can travel with dust particles. People will be familiar with a dust storm, but similarly, they're dirt particles, but plastics do exactly the same thing. Because they're so small. They're so small, they're so light. Up. And gravity doesn't really work very well on them. So they go wherever the air wants to take them. And if they touch down in a waterway, well, that's, that, they that's where they are. So we have these huge atmospheric movements happening at a planetary scale. So transcontinental planetary scale movements of, of material that they're defying borders, so they're defying, you know, if one country's doing a great job and that country's doing a less of great course. job. Of course, yeah, that's... You yeah. have all these policies that might look great, but, you know, rain doesn't stop for a, a line in the sand that no. we once created, right? Okay. Yeah, so we're actually connected, <clears throat> and we're connected with our water particularly, so because we're not making any new water. So we feel like there's new water when it rains. We feel that's new, but mm. it's actually very old water, that water is probably 4 billion years old. We don't think there's been very much new water for at least 4 billion years on the planet. So it's the same water doing loops. Okay, so the water goes, evaporates off the land and the sea, forms a cloud, and then comes back down again. If it goes back in the sea, fine, it stays there. If it goes to the land, it might go into the soil, into groundwater, where it may stay for... One week, it may stay for a hundred or a thousand years in an aquifer, depending on the geology of the area. But eventually, it always comes back out. Mm -hmm. So when our rivers are running and it's not raining, the water in the river is groundwater. Water. That's what's feeding the river, is that other water coming back in again out of our soils. So what's happening, one of these other, so we've got our aerial distribution of plastics we've also using a lot of plastics in agriculture now so both through that route of reusing agricultural sludge back out into farming containing microplastics putting it onto agricultural soils we get a rain event it washes off now we've got microplastics in the river we have uh, agricultural films we call them like for strawberries where you'll see the black rows of plastic yeah. in the strawberry plant tucked out the top most of those are single use. You'll see the rolls of silage where we have a, we've cut a whole lot of hay and we've bound it up in a plastic yep. pile of glad wrap. Slightly green tinge. Slightly yep. green stuff, yep. yep, and sometimes green or black and single use. Ends up in a great big pile in the corner, may get burnt, may just break down to little pieces of Is plastic. Is burning a bad option? So burning creates more problems, unfortunately. So it's not it's no real solution. Is not, it's not. That? It's not a great solution. So I mean, the first part of all these things is trying to understand the the thorny nature of the problem, and mm. it is a very wicked problem. Um, to be able to understand which way to jump, without jumping out of a frying pan into the fire, as right. it were, with a problem and creating another one. So burning of plastics has been promoted by some as a bit of a solution. So to say, oh, we could do waste to energy is sort of the, the business lingo trying to promote incineration of plastic it will burn it will combust but when you do that you create a whole lot of volatile chemicals and some of those chemicals are extremely toxic and extremely persistent so these are things like what we call dioxins which some people will the word might trigger something for people around when, when they heard that word dioxin and often for people it was during the Vietnam War when uh, we used herbicides. Agent Orange. Agent Orange and Agent Purple and Agent White. They had a few different colours. Right. We made some of them in Australia, actually. About a third of the chemical for that was made by Union Carbide in Sydney. In fact, part of the reason the fish in Sydney, west of the bridge, have a, uh, a limited amount permitted for eating, mm. an eating advisory, is because of the dioxins that came out of the plant that were dumped into Sydney Harbour. Wow. That's where some of those dioxins come from. So that legacy um, of that chemical lives on and is still cycling in the food web in Sydney Harbour, particularly west of the bridge, where we find elevated levels. And going back a number of years now, we had a commercial fishery there. And in fact, the story about those dioxins only came out through testing of commercial fishermen's families who were eating a lot of their catch. 
and they found very unsafe levels of dioxins. Well, the same crop. effects that happened in the Vietnam War, because you could potentially start seeing them, and they were horrific. They were horrific, yeah. So dioxins are not good for us. So, that, so yeah. by burning plastics, so what we're saying is, it's not. It, it might be a quick fix solution. You know, it might look like it's gone, but what you're actually creating is is potentially as damaging as a microplastic anyway, so... Yeah, so it's another toxic problem... Yeah, that we've that got we've, to deal with. That we've then got to deal with that is difficult to deal with. Yeah. And technically, um, we can create things like... A, we call them scrubbers on these plants, try and capture the gas, mm -hmm. uh, try and deal with it, and but then occasionally the scrubber breaks down and then you're going to release right. a whole lot of dioxin and if someone's living in the suburb next door... So they've put these things in Europe and now they're shutting them because of the dioxin contamination in the town areas around the plants mm -hmm. is now the soil is so toxic you can't grow vegetables in your backyard right this is not the sort of outcome we want to chase down so is it possible that based on what you were saying before that if hypothetically i'm a huge fan of hypotheticals we stopped all plastic distribution consumption everything today right now and the earth were to have a long you know, future. We weren't hit by a comet or something like that. Based off your, the, the, like the process of that water carrying those microplastics, putting it into the earth, potentially staying there for a long, long time. If we were wiped out today and you came back in, you know, 100,000 years, the, the microplastics aren't going anywhere because so, they've, they've either been deposited into the earth, come back into the river in a few thousand years' time via groundwater, or they've just been cycled around in this never-ending process, which is what makes microplastics global. So their, their, their half-lives, it depends on the polymer, so right. the, the, in terms of how long do they hang around. So some of them, they might last four or 500 years, we think. So it, it, is, it is still a bit hypothetical because we haven't been able to run the 500-year experiment <laughs> yet. Are you on that? So it's like, <laughs> well, I don't think I'll be around, but well, I wouldn't mind being around, but I don't think I'm going to make it. But... Uh, but some of the estimates are around this sort of time frame where we might be talking hundreds of years, mm. maybe to a thousand years, where other processes, so bacterial processes, may be able to eventually break up that plastic, break up the chemistry, and then turn it back into something else. So they do have a life. Yeah, they have a life. It's still a material that can, that can eventually be broken yeah. down. And certainly, um, you know, uh, technology people are exploring... You know, is there a way I could digest the plastic yep. or use the plastic? But I think with those solutions still off in the distance, uh, we've got to be thinking about what can we do now. right now to try and rein this in mm. as much as we can. Well, what, like the, just on that, solutions or whatever you want to call them, we can do a lot, you know, recreational fish shows. Let's, let's start there. You know, yeah. We're responsible for a lot. Now, I don't know the stats behind it, but fishing line, I can imagine, isn't great. If you're talking about the breaking down of plastics into microplastics, fishing line wouldn't be, <laughs> you know, it's not a great option to being, especially dumping 30 metres at a time out there, which does happen. I mean, I'm, yeah. it's an accident. No one intends to do that. But if you lose a fish, if you're chasing a snapper and you lose it on a reef and you have a 60 metre run, then there's 60 metres of braided and monofilament and potentially fluorocarbon line just sitting in the water. So a big one is, you know, keep 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 your tackle organised but then tie your knots correctly. Like, they're very basic ones. Have you... Th I, I assume all your thought is on more of a mass scale. How do we as a, as a species kind of change our behaviours? Yeah, well, I mean, even every, every fisher eats. Whether yep. they're, they're eating on the boat, they, they might have put yep. their lunch in a Ziploc bag. Mm -hmm. they could put their lunch in something else something else stainless steel tiffin yep done done tick one plastic bag gone, gone. not needed yep they could choose when they're going to buy their apples whether they buy apples in a plastic bag mm -hmm. or apples they put it in a cloth bag I'm going to play devil's advocate yep. if I choose this is very micro stuff but if I choose to buy my apples and, and not in a plastic bag and put them in a paper bag yep I've always thought that the supermarket is still producing the bag, right? So is the idea behind it that the less, the more people doing it, the less, de you know, the less demand there is for that particular bag, which means it doesn't get made and it's more of a, you're investing in the longer process of eventually getting people like supermarkets to not carry the bags. Yeah. 
So, I mean, there's, there's multiple uses that the supermarkets have for the bag. So there's both the convenience aspect of I've just bundled up a kilo yeah. of apples and you can't unbundle them and you yeah. can't pick the one that's a bit different yeah, yeah, to the yeah. others, right? So there's lots of reasons they might do it, but also it might help preserve the fruit longer and give them longer shelf life. So there may be these food, other food aspects or a sanitary aspect or something. Um, so there may be other reasons they want to do it. But we often have alternatives that aren't, um, that are, that are, safer so mm -hmm. we can take uh, non-plastic textiles so cotton mm -hmm. linen hemp um, uh, there's a bunch of different fibers that that we can make highly suitable carrying things out of mm -hmm. um, so in lennox here we have a great little initiative called boomerang bags uh, so where a couple of avid sewers simply take clothing that has passed its end of life at the op shop they sew them into bags they call them boomerang bags. You pick them up at the supermarket. You can take them home. The idea is that you take them back at some point. Mm. But because we often forget about the bag, so we're racing to the shop like, ah, oh, yeah, I've got the, got the bag. bag. Now I've got to get another bag. Well, they're like, oh, I'll just take, take, a, take a boomerang bag and bring it back. Great concept. It works. I love it. It's just a little community thing, and um, but it takes out hundreds of single-use plastic mm. bags. It takes out hundreds of green... The reusable but still plastic uh, bags you get at your Woolies and your Coles, mm -hmm. the green ones, you know, that, yep. that th these are still more pieces of plastic that we can avoid. So it's part of it is just trying to get into our head, is there a way each time I make a purchase, each time I consume something, can I choose a non-plastic alternative here? Yeah. Is, is the plastic essential? Do I really Do need, I need it? it? Do I really yep. need and it? And then once you've bought it, if it is essential, then doing the right thing with that plastic and you know if you're on the boat bundling all of it together and disposing it in it like a tangle bin or if there's a, a recycling initiative or just doing it at, at home when you get back, back yeah home. so we've got some we've got some level of recycling of plastic but it's really not terrific in australia at the moment yeah. and this is really something at a at a society level we we have to make some decisions on mm. and say to our governments well would we like better recycling i think most I people think wouldn't would. argue too yeah, hard yeah, about yeah. it i think they'd probably say i think it's probably a real good idea that we mm. recycle. We don't want to live in a rubbish tip. We, we don't want this stuff on our beaches. Mm -hmm. No one likes walking through plastic on the beach. It's not the experience and the romance nah. of, you know, likes, walks on beach, and plus plastic. No. Tourism's a big driver of our country, so you can soon lose the, the effect or the appeal if you start paddling your surfboard through a plastic bag anyway. So from someone who's studied it at a level much more than most people listening, are you optimistic about the future? Well, look, I think there's, there's, some, there's some good dialogue starting in, in the chemical industry particularly about designing things from the beginning that are safe. So rather than designing them because you've got a big supply of extra gas and you want to make money out of it, that's one starting point. But if we said, if we just pulled back and said, well, hang on, what's the full life cycle of mm. this thing I'm about to make? And is it safe? Because if it breaks it, if it breaks down, if it's going to end up in a fishery, and if it's going to then drive a reduction of the productivity of one of the foundational food resources on the planet, that doesn't seem like it's something that would equate with being a great idea. And so we should re-engineer that. We've got great skills in people like chemical engineers to try and think about how else do we do this. We clearly have a number of reasons to think hard about changing our love love affair with fossil fuels so climate change foremost for a lot of people mm -hmm. not everybody is buying into climate change but everyone's experiencing severe weather events everyone's experiencing these changes we know as scientists that part of the basis here is fossil fuel extraction and consumption and this is tied to the plastic story so if we can understand that these two things are in fact bad for our planet's health but bad for our health so plastics in our health are bad for our ability to reproduce don't worry about fish so we're having trouble breeding as people mm. we're up to one in six couples need fertility treatment in australia is that linked it's linked because of consumption of things like fish and because of exposure to plastics in all of the ways that we get exposed yeah some will some may be via fish Mm -hmm. So we know that, you know, for instance, uh, green mussels, which are, are grown over in the, the Bay of Thailand, they can contain extremely high levels of BPA, of that bisphenol A, mm -hmm. which has come out from the plastic plume out of the rivers 
of Asia where there's even poorer control on waste management and pl single-use plastic than Australia. So they then end up in a muscle, we eat the muscle, and we're acquiring the load of this hormonally active chemical beginning to influence our bodies and particularly the bodies of developing fetuses. So the biggest impacts of these things are often in the very, very early stages of life. And this is where I think the big parts of the fishery story, it's hard to get them told because they're just hard to see. Just like it's very hard to see a developing fetus in a woman, it's invisible. Initially it's two cells and you can't even see two cells. They're tiny. Mm. Two cells, then four cells. Now it might get exposed when it's four cells to a tiny amount of chemical through the blood of the mother that came from an exposure to plastic. It could have been from cosmetics you put on her skin. It could have been from um, cling foil that you put over her food. It could have been from heating her dinner. Is that why they say don't put... Don't put plastic in, in your microwave. microwave, right? So is the plasticizers come out of the plastic and into your food, right? So you might have ordered a lovely Thai fish curry, which was delightful, um, and then contaminated in your microwave by heating up the plastic, which has then moved into your food and now moved into your body. Now, it might not critically affect you as a 70 kilo, it's not a bit over 70, 85, let's be honest, kilo adult, it's been Christmas. <laughs> then, but, but if I was a reproducing woman and yeah. I had a fetus that weighed a fraction of a gram, that exposure could alter the trajectory of that, of that fetus for life. Wow. It could be born different. It could be changed neurologically. It could be changed. Its fertility could be changed permanently. So these are really sobering. This is the kind of yes, a less than happy part of the storyline. Mm. I think the happy part comes from the knowledge. Having the knowledge is an opportunity to recognise that there's a need for change. It's quite multifaceted. The need for change. Yeah. You know, our hobbies as fishermen. You know, I, I'm a passionate fisherman have been since I was little. I'm, you know, positively addicted. I think that's the word my partner uses. Yeah, healthy. Yeah. Healthy addiction. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, but I'm now increasingly conscious about, you know, how else can I minimise the impact of my activity, uh, certainly through plastic, mm. and, uh, you know, find, trying to find solutions. So there's a whole kind of raft of areas of things, you know, to-do list jobs of chemical engineers Here's my riddle. Riddle mm. me this. I want to do this with something. Find me something. Yeah. Breaks down, is safe, is able to be consumed, allows uh, to store and keep a, a product for a certain period of time so I don't end up with a plastic bag of prawns or a byproduct of, yep. of something that I, I'm currently consuming. Wow. Yeah. It is a sobering story, I must admit. You know, you hear that and you go, it could be the most crystal clear of water and you're in the most pristine and remote river in Australia somewhere, but the chances are that there is microplastics there and that has come from something as simple as a water bottle. Yeah, yeah, and so we, we'll go for a walk tomorrow along mm. some beaches that are pretty remote and we'll find water bottles, but what you might notice on the bottle is they won't necessarily have... Um, uh, branding. Branding, you won't say mountain fresh mm. or spring water. They'll say something in Chinese characters. That water bottle isn't domestic. Might have come a long way to be yeah. here. So it's, connectivity is a real thing. So mm. the way I understand it is not all rivers lead to the ocean in the strict sense. Anything kind of east of the Great Dividing Range, sure, they have they lead down to the estuary mouths and go out. A lot of the basin, that'll flow down to the mouth of the Murray. But via the process that you were just explaining to me, rain, birds, all that, the, the movement, that will eventually get out there. And then once you hit the open ocean, you're yeah. subject to the wind, tide, currents, everything. It's a big mixing pot. It's a big mixing pot. There. So Yeah, so we see images of the big Pacific Gaia, like they call it, of the big floating garbage patch. Yep. Um, is that a real thing? Obviously, yeah. it's real, but is yeah. it a big concern still? Well, it's a visual concern. Yeah. So it's one that, you know, it, it's, it's graphic. People look at it and go, it's clearly not right. Great big garbage patch in the middle of what should be a pristine ocean doesn't seem right. So it has motivated people to try and do something about it yeah. um, and different efforts to try and capture that waste and clean it up. So I think we've got to... So these are kind of what I would call an end-of-pipe solution. 
that one's probably from past the end of the pipe. Mm. The pipe's gone out and it's gone out into the sea. Both literally and metaphorically, <laughs> yes. So but now we need, to, we need to be thinking about the solutions that are way back at the source. Yep. About do we, do we generate the material in the first place? Yep. If we're making 14 million tonnes of the stuff that's ending up in our waterways a year, mm. then maybe that number's a bit too big. Well, yeah. And, and uh, that's adding to the 14 mm. from last year. And if it's going to last 500 years, you can see that we're going to be very plasticised yep. by the time you know, uh, another generation rocks along. So we've clearly got to do something about it. And I think there's some willingness mm. and activity there in, in, in global groups, like you have your, um, the UN group looking at uh, plastics and saying, look, ocean plastic's an issue. We need to take begin to address it. Mm -hmm. The freshwater plastic is still, you know, it's still kind of on the lowdown, really, in, in limited looking. But of course, once the looking begins scientifically, we begin finding. The beauty mm. of science is uh, we can look, and now we're getting you really find. powerful yep. tools, and we're finding, and then we're asking these questions: Does it mean anything? Yeah. Okay, so we found it there, but so what? What does it do? And they go, oh well, that's interesting. Those fish are behaving differently, or those fish aren't breeding properly or those frogs uh, are growing eggs in their testicles. That's not particularly That's not normal. Right. Yep. What's going on here? What collection of things are driving that? And uh, and begin to see that, that, yeah, clearly there's problems there too. One of the groups you can obviously get involved in is, is painted on your hat there and my shirt. Um, the one organisation that's brought us together today, Ozfish, regular cleanups, little removal events happening uh, nearly every week, every fortnight, I'd be I'd be safe to say, and then obviously on on huge efforts when things like Clean Up Australia Day come around. So if you're sitting at home watching this and you you're sobered up like I am right now because of the you know what Matt said, then you know you can kind of chip in and, and put your two cents in via just joining a group like Ozfish, getting involved in a local chapter and and having like a monthly clean up at your local waterway, for example, and. Based off what Matt said today, by taking a bottle, you know, you, you're, you're taking something that will eventually result in thousands of microplastics. That's right. You know, if we take 100 bottles, then that's great. So that's your bit of a call to action if you're sitting at home and you want to get involved. Mate, that is a fantastic chat. I learned a lot. I dare say you'll be on again at some point to chat about a whole raft of things, things like carp, the, sure. the carp plague, the redfin plague, the trout plague. You've told me a story in the car on the way here that I'm dying to hear more about. But for, for, for now, we'll leave it there. Time to go check out the local waterway. Thanks for joining Ozcast, mate. Yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure too. This episode of Ozcast is supported by the New South Wales Environmental Protection Authority's Waste Less Recycle More initiative, funded by the Waste Levy. It's also supported by Shimano, the Australian Recreational Fishing Foundation and BCF, Boating Camping Fishing.